All right, everyone. Um, I know it's been a bit of a long day. Again, thank you all for being here. We, we saved uh, definitely, uh, everyone's the best, like John Key said, but uh, we saved a really interesting talk and our Momento's good friend, Zoheb, uh, is here with us. Um, and we met actually through caching and through Redis, but our journey has brought us to AI and vector databases. And uh, I did a little teaser trailer with Zoheb with you um, a couple weeks ago. And one of the things that uh, was, don't want to spoil your talk, but uh, really excited about how you are going to explain to us the vector databases hidden in plain sight. So take it away. Thank you. Oh, wait. My name is Zoheb, already introduced. A uh, brief intro about me. Uh, I'm an engineering leader, engineering manager at DoorDash. Don't let that fool you. I've been hardcore dev for like since PHP three days. So memcache, yeah, I heard a yes. <laughs> they know the pain. Uh, and uh, I've been doing cache quite a lot, um, but turns out over time I've kind of developed my interest in storage overall. Uh, I'm a father of six, highly opinionated. Uh, some, it, I feel like any good tools, any two good tools, you're going to end up in a situation of Emacs whim. How many whim users here? Oh, wow, Emacs. <laughs> OK, so I'm assuming most of them are either Visual Studio Code or some, uh, some other IDE. OK, I'm old school. Emacs, there you go. <laughs> uh, I was doing this whole, we used to call it neural networks back in the day, sigmoids and all that, if you remember. Uh, it was not cool, considered brute force. Uh, my majors was in machine learning, and then I eventually graduated into other engineering stuff. Okay, uh, before I start, I want to give everybody a big disclaimer. Um, contents uh, for for sake of analogies and for making it simple. I've extremely, in fact, at a lot of places I feel like I've not done justice, but uh, I've extremely oversimplified stuff. Um, but this is intentional. Uh, as one of my professors always said, the first foray should be so simple that a child can pick it up. So I'm I'm trying to take that approach. So anybody who has got a little bit of experience, like four, three, four years, should be easily able to pick up stuff because you've used this in the past. Um, so let, let's, is it the updated one? It's fine. Uh, so let's say, let's think about why do we need vector databases um, to begin with. Um, a lot, you've already heard quite a lot about it. I'm, I'm just going to repeat a couple of things. Um, efficient similarity search. Manju did an awesome talk just right now where you're trying to retrieve similar items. Uh, data management and persistence. How are you going to persist it? You can't hold everything in memory. Uh, scalability to millions and billions. It's fine when you have a bunch of vectors that are like a couple of thousands and your CPUs or GPUs can handle it, but how do you go beyond that? and integration into traditional applications, and how do you enforce consistency and reliability. These are typical things that you would observe throughout um, almost all of the talks on because you have to scale these systems and build up bigger systems out of them. Oops, it doesn't work again. Come on, one more. One more. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so let, let's uh, let's compare. Let's start off with uh, basics. I, I feel like either skip a couple of slides in the middle, or um, anyways, there, there's a slide in the middle that was there on what this is for. Uh, can you go back to one more? Yeah. No. Okay. Keep going. It's fine. Um, so what's the difference between vector libraries and vector databases? You would see a lot of uh, libraries out there as well. One of the hallmark is FIAS. I don't know how people would pronounce it, but it's a library by Facebook. Uh, they give you out-of-box algorithms to kind of take your vectors and build, a data, build, build an index around it. So the 
core of the problem lies in the fact that we want to build an index around the whole uh, vectors that we have. So um, the major difference that exists uh, is uh, if you look at the libraries, they, they provide you the functionalities, but they don't provide you with the persistence there and the management aspects of it. So um, you, you, can, you can have the whole tree that they have built, for example, or the graph in memory, but there, there won't be a way to persist it, which means there, you, you have to do everything either on a single node or you won't be able to scale out, right? Uh, the databases on the other side, there, there's so many out there now. I just put in two examples, maybe as Pinecone. Uh, they don't only support operations like similarity search, but also offer built-in data, data management features where you can do deletions, updates, uh, and you can tinker with the data because you sometimes have to touch the metadata and the pieces that exist with that. So what, what are the use cases? Uh, let's get over the boring stuff so that we get into the good stuff. Like uh, typical use cases are uh, you're you know, a news organization um, and you're trying to look for particular topics that are similar to the news uh, or you, you want to figure out the sentiment about like, hey, here, here's a bunch of, uh, here are a bunch of articles. Here, here's the sentiment. Search engine, just like Manju mentioned, you can use vector database there. Uh, E-commerce websites, again, like every, every example is kind of spot on. So let's start with the basic then. What is an embedding? How, how many people feel like they actually know the embedding? That's fine. It's fine. Nobody? It's OK. So uh, um, and I, I, I've kind of structured the talk in a way that I'll give you an example towards the end where you would actually see something that you've been using as an embedding. And you, you probably never paid attention. Uh, an embedding is a relatively low dimensional space where you can translate a higher dimensional vectors. So um, I give you a bunch of text. Everybody's been using ChatGPT. How do I take that text and turn it into something that's understandable by your machines? Um, so back in the days, we used to call them vectors or matrix, even more fundamentally. So it's a single column maybe, or it's a multi, multiple rows, multiple columns. Uh, in case of images, for example, and you flatten them out. But essentially, what we want to do is we want to take your text and somehow translate into a vector, an array of numbers, array of floating numbers, that you can take and do some math on top of that. Right? So what that magic sauce is going to be, it's, it's a totally probably a course of its own. But you can imagine it as a layer in the middle where you feed it something as an input, an image, a text, or anything, and then it spits out an array for you. That array in inherently is the embedding. So here's an example for example uh, for cat and kitty. So imagine there is a there is a function where you feed it the text, a word, and it get, returns you back an array. So kitty and cat are gonna have some elements in there. And if, you, if you're paying a little bit of cl close attention, they, these vectors look pretty similar. Like the first element is the same, second is the same, third is the same, fourth is off by 0.1, the third, four, fifth is off by probably 0.1 again, and the last one is off by 0.6. And that is exactly what's gonna happen. A good model that's translating your input into an embedding is gonna give you vectors that are similar that, that would have lesser distance between them, right? So now you can imagine if I give you a whole corpus where I have a bunch of words, these vectors would be really close to each other. The distance between them would be really close and you would see these clumps. And if you imagine the hyperspace, you would see these clumps. So effectively, if you're looking at how a vector database system is working, you take your content, you, you feed it into the embedding model layer, which would help you index. And that index is built into the vector database and application then query and get the results back, right? So I can take a bunch of documents and say, here are all the documents, index them into the database, and then you come in and give me a sentence saying, oh, give me sentences that are similar to this or the documents that have these words. You feed it in. It translates into the same number array, and then it does some similarity matching, and the re results go back. That, that's essentially 
10,000 feet view of what a vector database would do for you. So how, how would the vector database actually figure out what's closer and what's not closer and how would it index it, right? So there are different search algorithms within vector databases that are implemented. I'm just gonna give you a brief overview. We're gonna pick one of them and we're gonna implement that one. So um, there, there are multiple techniques um, and all of them are ANN. ANN means approximate nearest neighbor. And it was always a mystery for me why it's always approximate and we'll get to that in a minute. So keep, let's keep a pin on that. So there is tree-based method. There are already existing sophisticated trees that you might have heard of, KD trees, R trees. So they divide space into smaller regions using a tree structure. So nodes would dif represent different nodes, uh, sorry, nodes would represent different regions of the tree. And then within those regions, you have all your vectors persisted. So you pick up from the tree, I am landing in this zone, and then you start searching vectors in there. So efficient for low dimensional vectors, but performance degradation for higher dimensions because it gets very very intensive to compute them. Then there are quantization based met methods. Uh, don't get scared off with these fancy names, I, V, F, flat. These are literally inter inverted, uh, inverted indexes on flat files, literally inverted indexes on flat files. And uh, this is one of the methods that uh, FIES gives you, like, out of the box. Um, group vector data into clusters uh, to avoid brute force search. So we try to group the vectors as they're coming in, and then we write similar vectors that are close in same region into one file. So now if a query vector comes in, we do the same process. We figure out, oh, it probably belongs to this file, and we go in and search it over there. So it's simple um, and high accuracy but the search efficiency gets impaired when the data is too large. So, of course, it's flat file. What do you expect? Then there are graph-based methodologies. Um, hierarchical navigation. Uh, don't, again, don't get scared by the terms. You, you would just Google them, find them. Use neighborhood graph to organize data into smaller vectors through um, a greedy scanning for the nearest neighbor and performing well on large groups. So essentially, you're building just graphs and then keeping the clues or clusters into one portion of the index. Performs well on large uh, data sets, but slow for building because every time you have to build that whole graph again. And then there is hash-based, which we're gonna focus on. Uh, local sensitive hashing, LSH. Uh, cut high dimension data space by hyperplanes. And we're kinda look, gonna look into this, what it means. Hash vector data into buckets, speeding up computations through direct hashing search. Simple, efficient, easy to implement, safe storage space. Accuracy is a little lower compared to other algorithms. It's not that bad, but it is bad. So, given you this much, it, so far it sounds like, hmm, it sounds the same babble terms, tech terms getting thrown around. Why, what, 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 what makes it simple? What, 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 where, is the, where is the key? So I said, in order to implement, in order to understand this, I wanted to implement one very simple, bare bone version, probably a toy version of a vector database myself. And that's the mission that I set out probably in 2021, if I remember it correctly. So I started re reading material on this stuff, right? Step one, step two, so on and so forth. Um, so the goals that I set out for myself was like, I want it to be extremely minimal. I don't want fancy features. I don't want additional stuff in there. And I want only two APIs. So one is add, where you provide the ID, you give it the vector, and you give it the metadata. The other one is search, where you provided the vector and the search threshold that you're willing to have for the similarity between the vectors. So the most simplest approach after reading materials was like, hey, if you want to go take a bet, local sensitive hashing. So the hash-based approach is most probably the most simplest one. So I set out the goal. I said, okay, I'm going to do it. I'll take as many components possible from off the shelf, and I'll try to glue them together. Uh, so Python for language because of the available toolkit, NumPy, samples, everything. Uh, SQLite for persistent because built-in, and everybody knows RDBMS. 
Uh, Seabor, that's an unusual choice people would sometimes say for vector civilization because JSON sucks for floats. <laughs> so Seabor is a, um, I don't know if people have used message pack here or any of these other protobufs. They, they are much better at binary serializing floats. So we cannot lose much accuracy by converting numbers into strings, high precision numbers and converting back. This is much better format. So I started reading stuff like, hey, what's min hash? And then there are a couple of papers you would see the reference in a, towards the end in the slides. And um, after two or three days, I was like, okay, not working out. What am I supposed to do here? Uh, so at this point, I gave up. I kind of gave up. I was like, I'm, I'm not getting anything out of it. Uh, machine learning hype was not there that much. So I, I kind of shelved the whole thing up. But then I, one random day, I was just browsing around. And then I saw a post, something similar to it. But I want to show you this visualization because I can't find the older link. So I found this particular URL. If you go to that, it's a really nice visualization of uh, vocal expressions. And you can, it's like 3D, you can navigate into it, and you can zoom into it, you can click into it. And each of these points, if you look at the color coding, there are the similarities in them. And while I was playing with this, that, that's where I had my light bulb moment on like, oh shit, I've, I've used this in the past. Why, why didn't I think of this before? Who here has used geodatabases? One, two, three, four. Wow. Who here is familiar with geohashes? Oh, look at that. Hands coming up. See, I told you. So if you think about it, and the, 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 for the people who have not used it, it's not very hard. I'm, I'm just going to explain it to you in, within the next few minutes. So if you think about it on every coordinate, every time you're putting in a pin or every time you're putting in an address, you're putting in an, a lat long coordinate on the face of Earth, right? And if you, if you look at that lat long number, that's precisely an embedding for a location. So this precise spot where I'm spending, or I'm, we're here, this precise spot has some lat long representation. That's a numeric representation that your machine can understand. That's precisely an embedding. So um, it's just that it's 2D. It's simple. It, it doesn't occur to us because it's simple and it's 2D. Nobody thinks about it. Um, but that makes my job easier to kind of explain it. So what, um, and we're doing, uh, when, whenever you're doing uh, these search queries on your Yelp, for example, give me all the gas stations, give me all the restaurants in this radius. What you're doing is effectively an ANN search, if you think about it. Here's a point where I am, and give me all the points that match this particular criteria within this radius. How simple is that? So it uses geohashes to find buckets in huge space and turns the huge spaces into smaller searchable spaces. So what's a geohash? So on the right, you can see a picture where we've divided world map into these geohash regions. So the beauty about geohash, it's a handcrafted hash. Think of it as handcrafted hash. Oh, it's not handcrafted, but yeah. Think of it as handcrafted hash. What it can do is each block there is represented by a byte, right? And the more number of, or a single character. So the bottom portion is one, then we have four, five, H, P, Q, R, N, right? So they represent one block. But the more characters I can pick, the finer the resolution becomes. So I took a simple lat long point, minus six, 106, and then I go over a resolution of from one to 12. One means I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tolerate having one character because, for example, I have that much stories. And 12 is all the way to 12 characters. And if you, if you look at it, the more resolution I get, the more characters I get, the higher the resolution is going to be. And what's the resolution going to be? For one character, is 5,000 by 5,000 kilometers. I don't know how to translate it into miles. Uh, two means one, two, five, zero. 
And all the way to 12 is like 37 millimeters by 18 millimeters, right? So that's the more precise, the more number of characters I can pick or the more storage I'm willing to spend, the more resolution I can get out of it, right? So what we've essentially done is you can think about this whole map and having small planes into it, the more we want to go deeper. So here is San Francisco, my favorite city, but in rags these days. So I, I take, so these are five characters with five characters that are representing this one block. But if I want to zoom in into it a little bit more, I can further divide that by taking six characters. So each of these squares represent a particular resolution, right? So now if I want to, if I want to have, now, now you can totally think of like, hey, okay, I want to, I want to restaurants in the whole Embarcadero area and I can just search within this zone to say, oh, everything in Embarcadero is going to show up here. But then if I get, go and say, I want all the restaurants in the, close to the Union Street, then I have to zoom in and I can pick it up there to have more fine-tuned results. So hopefully this made sense. Um, so far, th this is what our typical geodatabase is going to look like. So we're going to draw analogies out of it. So pre-processing, we pick a hashing function. So this was one of the hashing functions. I think um, um, Uber has a new one called H3. So instead of dividing the whole world into squares, it divides the world into hexagons. And hexagons are more composable, so higher resolution, much better. You pick a precision you want. Then what do we do in indexing and storage? So I'm going to give you a bunch of points saying, here are a bunch of coordinates on Earth with their metadata saying, oh, this one is a restaurant, this one is a hotel, this one is, I don't know, a bar. So for given coordinates, compute the geohash, and uh, here the hashes become your bucket identifier. So the moment you hash them, imagine them being part of a bucket. Save the coordinates and the metadata against the given bucket. So now you're down to saying, oh, here's a hash bucket and here are all the data points against it. So the bigger, uh, the finer the resolution of the bucket is, the lower the points would be, but the bigger the bucket is, depending upon your use case scenario, the more points there would be. So once we have stored this into a hash table, so essentially I flip the whole equation from saying taking coordinates and now I'm saying, okay, now we're going to go query it. You're going to take the query, the same coordinates that you're getting, compute the geohash on it, and it will tell you which bucket to look into because that's probably where you're most probably close to, where you're going to get most of your points, right? So use the hash bucket to compare the distance on each other. So once you have landed into the bucket, you take all the points, all the coordinates that you have, and you compute the distance from them. So rather than comparing distance with all the database, you're now focusing on this small piece. So in a picture, if I were to put it on a one page, this is what it looks like. You take the vectors, you index them, you get all these buckets with all those vectors. Then a query vector comes in, you do a bucket lookup, you, once you do a bucket lookup, you get candidate vectors that you have to filter on. And then you take query vector and apply filter by distance or threshold that you want. And you get the results vectors, right? So far, no rocket science. This is all done. This is all implemented. This exists today. OK, I'm going to take this and map it to your local sensitive hashing. So if I were to apply the same principles here, here's a vector. You take that up, feed that into min hash. Now, min hash is a technique that you would have to go read it, but it's a local sensitive hashing, meaning that it will keep similar features close to each other, even in case of hashes. And it spits me out a bunch of hashes there. I take those hashes and I band them. Band them simply means I bucket them into particular sizes. You can think of it as if I were in a 3D space, and I had a point. If two points were on the same plane, on the same x and y axis, but in a different z axis, they might be similar. So 
Bending is something similar, which is taking two hyperspaces. If I'm doing two here, it means I'm taking two hyperspaces, and I'm looking at those points in that particular hyperspace. And then these bands turn into, a, I just combine them for my bucket IDs, which is going to be the hashes. So these numbers, if I gen, just take them and serialize them into a binary byte array, these become my bucket IDs, and put I put them into my... Uh, I put this same vector in those three buckets. Same, same technique that we used in geohashes so far. So how do we query then? A query comes in, it goes through the exact same process. Goes through min hash, banded hash, gives me the bucket IDs. On the bucket IDs, I get the hits of the potential candidate vectors. So in this case, I, I know the colors are a little bit off, but it's combining the one on the top left and one on the bottom left. And these are my candidate vectors. And out of those candidate vectors, now I can do the exact same distance comparison to have result vectors. I've built a whole Python version of this, and I uploaded it here. Uh, you can just go to this URL. Uh, it has full implementation. It's a bare bone. Uh, Dune buggy, junkyard Dune buggy version of it. So don't use it in production. Use it at your own risk. But uh, what it would do is it would just open up the whole dimension for you to kind of get started and kicked in. For references, uh, I've pasted links. These slides would be available. Um, I took a lot of help from there. There are a bunch of more uh, from these links. Any questions? <laughs> 